Hey, this is Zach Log the Great. I am here tonight with my friend Nate. Hello. And uh, we are joined uh, once again by Chris. Hello. Um, and uh, we are getting together tonight to talk about Rudyard Kipling's poem, uh, Harp Song of the Dane Women. Um, uh, before we get to that, uh, an unusual announcement. Um, just a little preview. Um, I just got this book in the mail today uh, from one Rachel Fulton Brown. And uh, sometime in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully um, Nate and I and uh, Rachel will be getting together to uh, talk about that talk about that book. Uh, that's Centrism Games. It's a um, short book length poem. Um, satirical in nature, a uh, political satire of a kind. And uh, I read the first stanza so far. Um, so I don't really, I don't you know, really know what's going on just yet. Um, but if that sounds interesting to you, um, keep an eye out and we should be coming back with that. Uh, it should be in just a few weeks. Uh, we, sh we should be able to get together hopefully and talk about that. Um, let's see. Uh, the usual announcement, if you um, like these videos, if you like my work, you want to uh, support the show, um, you can do that through uh, subscribestar.com slash zacklog hyphen the hyphen great, and that link is in the show description. Having said that, um, Nate has offered to read the poem for us tonight, so I'm going to put that up on the screen, and he is going to be our... Uh, Narrator for the evening. So, here we go. Uh, if I suddenly keel over and go silence because I have the very deadly Chinese virus and it may take me any time. Nate! Nate! We talked about this. You can't use that term. You just caused some poor Chinese grandmother in San Francisco to get beaten up for no reason. Yeah, but it was black guys that did it, so... It's not my problem. Statistically okay. real. Look it up. Here we go. <laughs> sorry, I got you demonetized already. Oh, what is a... Or sorry, Harp Song of the Dane Women, Rudyard Kip. What is a woman that you forsake her and the hearth fire and the home acre to go with the old gray widow maker? She has no house to lay a guest in but one chill bed for all to rest in, that the pale suns and the stray bergs nest in. She has no strong white arms to fold you, but the ten times fingering weed to hold you out on the rocks where the tide has rolled you. Yet when the signs of summer thicken and the ice breaks and the birch buds quicken, yearly you turn from our side and sicken. Sicken again for the shouts and the slaughters, you steal away to the lapping waters, and look at your ship in her winter quarters. You forget our mirth and talk at the tables, the kind in the shed and the horse in the stables, to pitch her sides and go over her cables. Then you drive out where the storm clouds swallow, and the sound of your oar blades falling hollow is all we have left through the months to follow. Ah, oh, what is woman that you forsake her, and the hearth fire and the home acre, to go with the old gray widow maker? Okay. Uh, thank you, Nate. Um, so, since A, Nate just read for us, and uh, B, we haven't had you on for a while, uh, Chris, would you like to uh, lead off with uh, your thoughts on this poem? Okay. So, the first thing that strikes me is th there's this sort of thing that just naturally, I, I think, appeals to some people as just sort of a human thing. But it's sort of like the desire to see what's like over the next hill. Just wanting to know like what happens next, what's out there. Where you're willing to leave something comfortable to go out there. Uh, and that and find other people and kill them and take their stuff. Yes, that that's one further part of it. Uh, 
so I, so the general thing is just sort of you know go out there go explore and then unfortunately there is the necessity of you know warfare violence uh which some people choose to participate in uh some willingly some sort of you know not by choice but uh but it's something that happens and it's i don't know it's i think it's one of those things that you either feel the desire to go out there or you don't you might maybe lean one way or the other but yeah this is definitely looking at the the one side where it's like well what what's good about doing that why why would you and i i think some people would just be like like the whole well you climb mount everest cuz it's there uh, some people, it, they just have that innate desire to be out there. Yeah, I um, mean, you know, go ahead. I agree with you, Chris, that, uh, <clears throat> you know, for some people it is the, it is the horizon, but for the Vikings, I feel like it was a bit of, or for the Danes anyway, I feel like it was a bit of both, you know, a desire to go, but also not a whole lot of choice. I mean, it's like, look, Dane woman, um, you come from a, a harsh, resource poor place. So your men need to go raiding. You know, they think that, hey, there's things we're only going to get by heading out on the waters and taking it by force. Uh, and so they, they have to. Well, you know, this actually... Not, not like I said, the, the Danes aren't farmers. There's a reason for that. Well, and, uh, yeah, to, to to directly answer the question, you know, that, that she's asking, it's like, well, you see, if I didn't do this, you would be with some other guy who did. Yeah. It's like, why, you know... It, it, it's not everything, but there's a, you know a, a quite significant por- uh, you know portion of male behavior is you know why do you do this to get women? <laughs> Although and, I think uh, women get a bad rap. I mean, you know, it was, it was Danish sailors that came upon the the great fire of Lindisfarne, where the you know, where the, the abbey was on fire and everybody was mysteriously dead and they rescued all of those relics. <laughs> Selflessly. Yeah, I, 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 yes, I, I've also yeah. seen the, the meme where they're talking about uh, contemporary sources that basically describe that all the English women wanted to be with the Vikings because they actually treated women well and bathed regularly. Mm-hmm, Yeah. They're talking about the need to exterminate the men of the Dane law because they're they're uh, a uh, a challenge to the chastity of good English wives. Yeah, but th- but they're not going to tell their uh, their wives back home that that's what they're doing. So the wives back home are like, well, w- what could possibly be out there that you would want? Poor women. <laughs> What's the? Uh... No, and that point, it's, the point that you're talking about is actually uh, there were certain sort of counties on actual England, you know, the islands of Britain, where the Vikings are basically running things. That's why it's called the Dane laws, because in those areas, the Danes were the law. And so, uh, yeah, that actually was in England itself. It wasn't, they didn't have to go anywhere. I am the law. Then, of course, there's, I, I forget where I saw this one, but I saw this one a long time ago, you know, why are Scandinavian women so hot? Because they left the ugly ones behind. Hmm. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> but it, more than that, so, I mean, you could write this, you could write this poem from the point of view of any woman throughout history until you get to the hairy-legged feminist age. And it would be, you know, the same longing that the man has to go out and do things, and the woman would really rather him just stay home, even if, you know, that's sort of like her 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 basic thing, is like, yeah, I wish you didn't have to leave me. But uh, 
at the same time, you know, you know this woman is sitting there not judging the man so harshly. You know, you know she understands him, but at the same time, like, ah, does it? Why does it have to suck like this? But well, and and it's also and. And it's also, um, and you know, this is still true today. It's the men who um, who reliably end up, uh, you know, doing the jobs that are likely to get the people doing them killed. You know, it's mm -hmm. the it's the men who are out logging, who are out. What's the? I'm trying to remember. I, I saw the like you know ten most dangerous jobs. Um, I think crab fishing actually was on that list. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I crab I, fishing, oil field work, uh, roofing, I think, uh, being like, you know, highline electricians. And yes, all of these are heavily, uh, you know, male, um, uh, professions and, it's uh, I exclusively males, uh, because the woman there is a unicorn and it's, uh, you don't hear feminists, uh, you know, asking for representation in any of these fields. I notice. Um, why aren't there more women coal miners? Haven't heard that one from a feminist lately. Um, <laughs> well, they but, didn't ask why are there coal miners. Well, there's that too. <sighs> but, but yeah, and it's the you know the same thing, you know. Not just, you know, why do you have to go away? Why do you have to go away and I might never see you again? Um, and, you know, for her it's worse because not only might never see you again, might not even ever have any idea what happened or when right. you're back. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there that goes right along with, like, military wives. The idea that, yeah, only, only you know, the actual service member is, you know, doing the fighting. But it's the whole family that's making the sacrifice. Which is why we should be, you know, very careful that we don't get into any more of those than we absolutely have to. And why we were supposed to finally be getting out of, out of Afghanistan and then uh, whoever's running Joe Biden decided to put that off until September and God only knows if it will actually happen then. Um, God knows, but I have a strong suspicion about it. Uh, anyway. <laughs> another Kipling poem about, you know, the, the women you might encounter uh, in, on the Afghan frontier. Um, but, uh, it is... It's funny that you know uh, that this this Dane this Dane woman here is you know thinking about how nice all this stuff is. Like she points out all the nicest bits of being home, and it's not like the guy hasn't realized that all this is still there. But there is. Uh, it's interesting that. You know, men do need to really need to just go out and do things with men. Like we really have, it is a necessity for us to actually like have a gathering where we're like, yes, we're all men together doing man thing. And so, uh, in his series on the four loves, it was pretty fun uh, listening to uh, to C.S. Lewis talk about it, and he's talking about uh, friendship. And then he's talking about that uh, particular version of the four loves. And he's like, yeah. Uh, he's like, you know, it's always been a thing that, you know, men went out and did things and spent a lot of time just having to work around and spend time with other men. And they went and did things that only men would do. And women, at the same time, were with the other women doing things that only the women did. And so... You know, it's like, you know, between actually planning the hunt, executing, getting everything, you know, like cleaned out and brought back, you know, maintaining weapons and then, you know, kind of doing a post-mortem on the hunt. Like I said, you know, men spend a lot of time together in male-only gatherings. And he amusingly observed that it's like, 
No matter what weapon he might have chosen, the caveman definitely had a club. But, uh, I, I, yes, we, we don't know for sure whether he had a club on a shoulder, but on his shoulder, but we can be very certain that he had a club of the other kind. Um, there it is. Uh, but I, I feel kind of silly because, um, it actually took me a while as I was, you know, reading over this again and again, you know, working on memorizing it to realize it took me a little while to realize the old gray widow maker is the ocean. I, did you think I, it was? <laughs> I think I had, I think I had thought war. I think my first, my first impulse when I was reading through this was just war. And then it was like, and it's like, but we're, how are the pale suns and the stray bergs in there? And I'm like, wait a second. There's stray icebergs out in the ocean. And the sun, if you're on the west coast, would set in the ocean. Oh, okay. Now this makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah, the sea has been calling the sons of men out onto it since forever you know ever since we we learned how to stick wood together in such a way that it would mostly float and so i mean this could be the dane women this could be the english to an extent irish all kinds of folks uh time you know from time around just you know uh various you know mediterraneans and Greeks. A uh, a tribute, by the way, to the um, ancestors of the Australian Aborigines, who apparently figured out how to do the longest sea voyage anyone had ever done, way before anyone else, and then completely forgot. <laughs> yeah. Like, how did you get here? We don't know. Yeah. Well, w one interesting thing is because of like s so much of Australia is just not really habitable for large numbers of people, like most of the people groups only like got to a size of about 50 or 60 people maximum because they just had to keep their distance from each other. So even like languages and dialects just were all over the place. So trying to keep any like bit of knowledge or history going is pretty much impossible over any span of time. Yeah. Africa's a terrible... Africa, Jesus Christ. Australia's a terrible place. Africa is pretty... Would, would be a paradise if you had productive cultures there. Well, I, wildlife is still pretty nasty, I understand. Um, that's... Uh, Australia, Australia if I develop, look, Russians develop culture in a place where there's frozen six or eight months out of the year and there are bears and wolves. So, I mean, yeah, okay, but come on. I feel like I feel like if you can't beat the people who live in the tundra to having a decent civilization, then maybe you're not trying. But but also, if you're in the tundra, you probably don't have enough resources for other people in a position to do it to actually try to take what you have away from you. Whereas if you if you live in a place that has a lot of resources, then you're going to spend a lot of time and energy just protecting what you have and not necessarily advancing. Although for I mean, this is about as off topic as ever. Um. Uh, for Africa, you know, up until the, I don't know, 17th century? When did we figure out quinine? Up until, like, a couple of centuries ago, that was only ever other Africans you were dealing with because no one else could go there and survive. But, and at the same time, Egypt is a pretty awesome civilization. True. But that's only one little corner of Africa. Well, that's that's also the uh, I, I've generally heard a dividing line. You know, uh, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa are, are uh, North Africa is basically part of the Mediterranean uh, 
world and even genetically um or at least was until recently i don't it seems to me that's changed in recent centuries but anyway let's see let's find a way back to the poem <laughs> well i mean jumping back like this kind of ties in we we've already talked about it but to summarize the danes didn't necessarily have a lot so they looked at who had the resources oh, that's true. It's and like that's how they, they could just spend all of their time training to take what the farmers and and you know whoever did. And that's how we got the term the Dane Geld. Um, and once you have paid him the Dane Geld, you'll never be rid of the Dane. What was uh good Kipling poem? I, I have to say, in terms of like the uh the emotion the the use of sound and the emotional effect of of the poem like the next to last stanza um the rhyming words he chose there you know then you drive out where the storm clouds swallow and the sound of your oar blades falling hollow is all we have left through the months to follow and that the um the thud of those that double those double o's there is you know, definitely fits with that, with the, you know, kind of emotional emptiness that he's talking about. Well, and even in terms of, like, emotional emptiness, like, even, like, what she's using, like, to appeal to him, like, she's not bringing up, like, like, hey, your children are here, your family's here. It's like, hey, there's a woman for you. It's warm. It's your own place. Like, like she, she, she's going for very like physically appealing things. Whereas, if it were an emotional appeal, I feel like like family and and stuff like that would play a little bit better role. It's also uh, kind of interesting. You know, the first and the last stanza are uh, repeat, but not quite. You know, there there is one change in that uh, the first line of that stanza. You know, what is a woman um, to, you know, what is woman? And it's, you know, slight but pretty significant change there. A woman is a responsibility is what it is. <laughs> It's more. It's more than just the strong white arms. Uh, you know, it's more than it's more than the bed and mirth and talk at table. You know, you you have to. There's there's a pay for upkeep that has to be done here. Well, and it, it's and uh, just, you, you know, know I, say that hey, the woman wants pretty things or she's gonna dump me. It's you know, hey, the woman wants food. You know, the woman wants things that I may not be able to make. Or obtain locally, so the woman, you know, to to give her what she needs and even what she wants, I gotta go. So a woman well, it, is a, a responsibility and a burden as much as she is a pleasure. Well, and it's uh, I've I've heard uh, Stephen Molyneux you know refer to this one a few times. You know, there's a uh, you know between what a single guy needs to live and between and you know. And a guy who's you know married and has kids, like it's about a ten times difference. Um, mm. You know what what you have to what you have to do, you know, just at you know survival level. Um, and so yeah, it's a you know it's pretty significant change, and I, I would never advise it, but you you do occasionally see a certain amount of. You can understand the, you know, kind of, you know, MGTOW idea a little bit every once in a while. Um, yeah, well, and getting into that, I, I think, like, that stuff's an investment. It's not just the pure pleasure. Well, yeah, and it's, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, kind of old attitude you know, in, uh, you know, Proverbs to, you know, children is like, you know, a, you know, 
a handful of suns is you know a, a quiver full of arrows, and you know pity the man who you know doesn't have doesn't have this uh, this uh, you know is, is not so well armed something like oh heck where is that I should actually find that. Uh, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children, the children of, children of the youth. Happy is the man that has have his quiver full of him, them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Um, so, yes, it is, it is also, you know, if you handle it correctly, an investment in the future. Um, Regrettably, today don't most people don't seem to take that kind of attitude, um, which is causing problems. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. What we'll say: if you do it right, life will make you tired. <laughs> And if you do it wrong, it'll make you dead. Um, oh, it'll make oh. you dead either way. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Life don't kill you, son. The only thing worse than getting old is the alternative. Um, <laughs> yeah. <sighs> I don't know. I guess in the end, you know, what a man wants, right? Or at least, you know, a man who's considering things rightly and trying to live in an honorable fashion. What you really want is that when you go out and do your work, you get, you know, you get what your work is worth. And then when you come home, you are appreciated for what you have done. And so you, you, know, you want to know that when you've gone out, given up this portion of your life, that it's going to be valued and treated well, you know, that what you've brought home isn't going to be wasted and that, you know, the person you've worked on behalf of, you know, worked to support is going to be there to smile, give you a kiss and just, you know, treat you kindly and respectfully. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, I'm, and that's another thing that's falling by the wayside in this modern era. And it's one of the reasons that men are just so damn unhappy. You know, I mean, look, we don't need much. Pat on the head, some nice words. And, you know, just, that's just about it. So, you know, maybe a hot meal. It's all very simple. But apparently to ask for these things as a man these days is supposed to be demeaning. I'm glad my wife isn't so stupid as to believe that. But uh, There well, are a whole lot of them that are. Well, and it's, uh, what's the... Uh... You know, the, uh, you know, Chesterton uh, saying, you know, modern uh, w women's liberation is the idea that a woman is a slave is a slave if uh, she works to serve her husband. But but, uh, you know, free and happy if she works to serve a, a boss who never sees her face. Well, I, I, I think one thing is. So a wife can appreciate what her husband does. And the husband can appreciate what the wife does. Those two aren't mutually exclusive. No, 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 absolutely not. And I, I feel like that's where the disconnect, the disconnect is. Because on the, like on the other hand, like you say, whenever you get home, you know, you want your wife to be smiling, greet you with a kiss. I think some would incorrectly argue that you just expect your wife to be ready, you know, just to serve your needs in that. But I think it's also when you get home, like for your wife, you're going to greet her with a smile and a kiss. Yes. 
And that's the thing. It, it requires, you know, the, the appreciation has to go both ways. You, otherwise, you're just taking it for granted and you're both going to end up screwed. But no, and that's the thing. I don't even need the kiss right away. <laughs> I'm just like, I mean, we have five children. Sometimes, sometimes I come in and she's like, oh, good. Kill three of these. And I'm like, oh, bad day, huh? And she's like, yes. They've not wanted to listen to anything, and I've been threatening them with you for hours. And now they're starting to understand that, oh, wait, yes, we are going to have problems. So, I mean, it ain't every day. But eventually, we're going to catch up with each other. We're going to spend some time. And, you know, said I'm going to make sure that I notice, you know, what she has done. And I'm going to, you know... Make sure I'm going to kind of look around the house and see if I can pinpoint some specific thing that I know is different. And I'm going to make sure I point that out to her that I noticed it so that she knows that, yes, I am not just going, yeah, oh, yeah, this is the house. Boy, that thing you didn't do sure irritates me because, again, she's got a lot on her plate. And so, you know, I, I want her to show that even if she didn't get to something she wanted to do, the things she did are worthwhile. And so, you're right, Chris. We do need to support each other. And we do have to both appreciate each other's labor. Uh, so, what was, um... <sighs> I don't know. I think, uh... Yeah, I think... I covered most of the things I wanted to say about this poem here. Chris, how about you? I I think that's pretty much it. Um, let's see, I'm just brushing over it again real quick to see if anything jumps out at me. Well, now, one thing, it says, uh, you forget our mirth and talk at the tables where... I think that might be an unfair characterization because as he's away, he's probably, you know, thinking back to like, oh, you know, when I get back, I have this to look forward to. Like, that's probably what's actually fueling him. But, but that's, but that's still like an honest uh, view. Like, like that's honestly what it looks like from her point of view. So it, it's, it's understandable, and it, I think it does create a little bit of a tension there because the narrator, this is a true thing. But as the reader removed from the situation, we can kind of relate to both sides. Uh, and I, I think the point of it, the poem, isn't necessarily to uh, say that she's, you know, completely 100% right. I feel like it's kind of meant to balance the trope of just glorifying the adventurer, the warrior, uh, just sort of like, hey, you know, there's also people, people at home that, uh, that this isn't, like, they don't have the glory. They just sit and wait and worry. Well, that's, that's a very good point. And it's kind of, you know, you need the you you really got to have the things that glorify the hero and you know you need your sagas you need your epic tales and all of those things to you know motivate these men when they're young and to give them something to strive toward in their you know to reach manhood but at the same time it is good to sort of you know <laughs> to sort of have the the poem for the for those left behind, you know, and so I I really enjoy kind of thinking about the split between the two things, because I mean, if you didn't have the poems that were like, you know, yeah, and, you know, I split this guy, you know, and this great hero split four dudes in half with one swing of his axe, and you know, he could throw a spear five miles through the eye of a, you know, through the eye of a sparrow. And he was awesome, and this is the perfect man. Then you know, men wouldn't 
be nearly so willing to leave and risk their lives, you know, on the old Grey Widowmaker. But at the same time, you know, if we're honest, a more honest sort of idea of how we feel about all this is probably more like this poem. You know, she's like, I wish you wouldn't go. And after a couple days at sea, he's like, man, I wish I was at home. But ultimately, you know, you tell some stories to to get people to go, and then you tell other stories to get them to come back. And so this is the second story. And it's, they're fun to see as well. Yeah, I, and if I, you're I, in the... If you're in the 18th century English Navy, you're like, how did I get here? I don't remember this at all. But, uh, I, I, I've heard that uh, the U.S. military, their recruiting strategy sort of changes on like how many volunteers they have, where whenever a lot of people are volunteering and they're all staffed up, all of their advertising is about how tough it is, the challenge and everything. And then whenever they really need people, they just play up like the glory and adventure stuff. <laughs> uh-huh. Where it's like, oh, wait, we, we need people? Oh, yeah, let's talk about how great this is. Oh, we have too many people? Oh, this is a terrible job. You don't want it. <laughs> no, this is hard. Only the hardest, toughest people can do this. Oh, gosh. Now I'm thinking of news stories I've heard recently comparing U.S. Army recruiting to, like, Russian our recent Russian army recruiting. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't think I want to go into that tonight. Uh, so, <clears throat> Nate, how about you? Any uh, last thoughts on this one tonight? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to go out to sea to make money. I just got to go work in air conditioners. Dirty and smelly and sweaty, but rather less likely to kill you. And also, you know, you get to be home with your wife at night. Um, uh, and, uh, and also, you know, something we actually you know, need as opposed to possibly my job, but won't go into that right now. Uh, anyway. Uh, so... Um, yeah, I think we covered, uh, this one, uh, decently well, any, um, so thank, uh, thank God for Rudyard Kipling and his fascinating writing. And, uh, thank both of you for joining me tonight. It was fun. Yep. It was a good one.